the jobs are core business for unions. And uh, you uh, may have heard that we started the campaign for a just transition with a saying that there were no jobs on a dead planet. So clearly, you know, we need to have a sustainable planet with decent work in order for the shared prosperity that provides workers with hope and security for a future. So climate is absolutely a workers issue. The other issue is for workers, if you're going to transition every industry, and we must, to be net zero, then we need to make sure that that transition is just, and that requires unions to be at the table, whether it's at company level, or indeed community level, if it's cities or government level, in terms of agreements that develop a plan, an agreed plan that gives workers the hope of a secure future. We've had those conversations and it's painful. I won't tell you it's not painful. As somebody who's walked the coal fields and talked to uh, miners and to their families, then that's a scenario that is very difficult for many of them to grasp. But we're actually beyond that. Investors are not investing in coal. Workers know that. What, what they want is indeed the simple but uh, significant just transition measures that actually give them certainty. When will the jobs, whether it's in coal mining or coal-fired power stations, be uh, come to an end? What is the uh, transition arrangement? So you need secure pensions. Sometimes you need a bridge to pensions if workers are just shy of their pension and make the choice to actually retire early. You need uh, the guarantees that there will be income support, reskilling support and redeployment support for jobs either in other areas of an industry, so renewable energy versus coal-fired power stations, for example, often different skills and understanding, sometimes uh, quite compatible, but depending on the technology, or separately, other areas of the economy. So it's not that there aren't jobs. The economic uh, statistics show you that if you invest in climate, in climate action generally, you create jobs. The real question is, can we make sure that those jobs are available for workers who've been displaced? Or if they're in the north of a country and you're in the south of a country, what do you do to create investment in those communities that will offer jobs that are available for redeployment. These are the things that you have to tie down in an agreement so workers have certainty around their future. We've had many transitions. You can pick an area in the manufacturing sector or other se sectors of the industry. They haven't always been just. We've seen whole communities decimated with shifting technology, shifting industry focus. And what we need to do this time is make sure that, uh, the, re that the resistance to actually moving rapidly to stabilise the planet is actually reduced because workers and their families can see that they have hope, that their communities will have investment, that they'll maintain jobs in the community, and that they uh, themselves and their children will able, be able to see a future, whether it's in those jobs or in other jobs in the same industry or in other industries. Trust transition is a very simple concept. It is all about security. Are there jobs? If there are no jobs, uh, then is there a bridge to pensions so workers have the dignity in retirement? If they're younger workers, do they have income support, reskilling and redeployment support? And is there investment in their communities to make sure that there are alternate jobs? It's that simple. 
what we need to do now is say, if we are building recovery, even as we're living with this virus, at least uh, for the foreseeable future, then what are the elements? And of course, the ITUC's priority is to fight for a new social contract. It has five key demands. Jobs, jobs and jobs, climate friendly jobs with just transition, rights, the floor of rights for all workers, because we have a broken labour market. 60% of the world's workers now work informally. No rights, no minimum wages, no rule of law. And unless we put a floor of rights, the ILO Centenary Declaration negotiated in 2019, has that recipe under all workers, irrespective of employment arrangements, this will get worse. Even in the formal sector, can I tell you, 40% of workers only, and the third of those have insecure or precarious work. Then universal social protection. At the moment, 73% of workers, despite it being a UN commitment, a global commitment to provide universal social protection, have little or no social protection. So we have to make that possible. One of our core demands is, of course, universal social protection, but also a global social protection fund to help build those systems in the poorest of countries. And equality generally. Incomes, yes, despite the world being up to seven times richer in GDP terms in the last 30 years, then labour income share is like a roller coaster going down. And so the shared prosperity that the world should function on simply doesn't exist. So incomes, yes, gender, and indeed race. And of course, inclusion. We need an inclusive future that's based on multilateral reform, a just transition model, the capacity for peace and stability in our world to see that people are not excluded and that we are not creating further inequalities. So jobs, climate-friendly jobs, rights, universal social protection, equality of incomes, gender and race, and inclusion. So there are, so nobody is left behind. I mean, if you've had, if you have a social crisis because globalization has indeed failed to share prosperity, that our supply chains have been based on dehumanising exploitation, where low wages, often unsafe work, even informal work or modern slavery can be found, then that's one area of crisis, and that's the social crisis. And you've seen, you know, company flight, capital flight, all of the things that go with that. But then the other crisis is indeed the fact that we have overused because of no or zero regulation, planetary resources. So if you are indeed breaking down the planetary boundaries, so whether it's climate change devastation and the shift from coal, whether it's changing seasons and the loss of livelihoods for many of our workers in agriculture, or indeed it's the devastation of climate uh, extreme weather events, and the loss of lives and livelihoods, all of these things are actually interrelated to a global model of economy that has failed. It's failed to protect nature, it's failed to protect people, and it's been based on a mindless and relentless development that hasn't actually been regulated, and all too often based on exploitation, where working people have simply missed out on a fair share of the prosperity. Before COVID-19, as I said, those historic levels of inequality were generating a despair and therefore an anger. We talked about an age of anger and it was becoming global. You could find people simply on the streets in every continent. If you think about our world today, we have less than 50% of people in democracies. And even within those democracies, there's now, you know, a serious percentage of growing authoritarianism. So when people feel excluded, and some of that can be found in the increasing level of um, distrust or a lack of trust from young people who don't feel they've seen a democracy dividend, or people in developing countries who haven't seen a democracy dividend, then the world's in, in danger. You can't run a business 
you can't build a sustainable model if indeed we don't have democratic uh, futures. And in that, in that environment, our democracies have to change because unless people can see that the contributions they make through their taxes, the investment they make in uh, voting for particular governments is in fact uh, that, that those governments are accountable to people for the things that matter to them, then we will continue to see a, uh, a breakdown in trust. So it is all in connected, interconnected. And if you take a place-based approach, then people can very easily see what the problem is. The real question is, do we have the political will for the multilateral reform that will actually give people a sense that globalised uh, interconnectedness, not on the same model, but on a different level of shared prosperity, can again be trusted and therefore they're prepared to invest in it. And that is all coming back to our new social contract. If there are jobs, if they're climate friendly jobs, so people don't feel like they're then going to be at risk again in two or three years time. If there is a floor of rights with social protection and greater equality and inclusion, then we will gain the trust of people again. But our very democracies depend on that. Look, I think there's a divided business community. The, there are a number of, uh, you know, major multinational companies who understand that the, the business model has to change. They have made commitments on environment and social issues including human and labour rights and mandated due diligence and indeed protecting their workers, their low paid workers from um, dismissal while they reskill them and use them in other parts of the company or help them with redeployment. But they're under enormous pressure. There is in fact a moment of truth because the shareholders might talk about indeed stakeholder uh, futures not shareholder futures, but they're not prepared to actually see the share price uh, uh, take any kind of hint. You can have a look at the impact that COVID-19 had on many companies and you find the shortcomings. If you take many of the multinationals who couldn't pay their existing orders in uh, supply chains or give um, smaller manufacturers in their supply chains confidence for future orders, even though those businesses have to continue to, to uh, operate because they didn't have the cash in hand because you've got a just-in-time society, whether it's just-in-time manufacturing or just-in-time cash flow. So if your front doors close for a month or three months, then the cash is not there. And yet, despite that, we've seen many businesses make mega profits, including some of those multinationals, if you take an asset and investors calculation. So the world is already crumbling where, you know, the shareholder price is everything. There are companies that have to come through that. They're fighting to come through it. They're fighting to have a more sustainable mechanism. And if you look at the work of people like Paul Polman, who, is, uh, who convenes CEOs around many of these principles, or the B team or other areas, uh, the B4IG group of companies, they know the model has to change. The real question is, is the corporate greed that's actually designed the last three decades of this model prepared to change? And that will be the telling point because if they do, people will work to rebuild trust. If they don't, then we'll see more of that despair and anger and uh, the volatility of global futures. If you look at who's on the front lines of uh, the climate impact, in many, many areas, it's women who are indeed on the front lines. It's well documented in agriculture and community services in a range of areas. So investing in climate with an appreciation of a holistic uh, uh, ecosystem of climate, business and in inclusion 
then women benefit. But at the moment, we've got, you know, women who've simply fallen out of the labour market because even in a shift to the virtual uh, world for about 18% of workers, and indeed, in addition to that, the devastation of the loss of jobs or working hours, then it's women who've been at the forefront of that. And it's women who are trying to cope with uh, uh, working from home or remote work, with childcare, with other areas of care through the generations. So we have to invest in what it is that builds the fabric of our society, whether it's social or whether it's environmental. And women are there in every image of that future if we are prepared to engage in building a recovery and resilience that is about involvement of everybody. If you look, you can find women everywhere. If you look to our informal economies, it's actually some of the poorest women who are building cooperatives in communities, who are changing over, you know, diesel pumps in salt mining to uh, solar pumps. You know, there are lots of stories in agriculture, in energy, in community services where women themselves are building independent and indeed cooperative ventures. But we're not seeing that breakthrough for women in our traditional uh, corporations. I mean, take a look at the boardrooms, take a look at equal pay or the lack of pay transparency. You can still find a world in 2021 that is appallingly unequal for women. So unless we again are prepared to change our economic model, our attitudes, our sense of commitment to diversity in terms of women, race, inclusion of young people, you know, the world has to change. And I'm sad to say it can no longer be a world dominated by simply, uh, you know, traditional uh, white men who are not prepared to shift a business model. So <laughs> ask me, women, every time. They will take the risk, they will work for their families, they'll build their communities, and that's what we need. I would simply say the answers lie in social dialogue. If you have the social parties at the table at all levels, if you have workers, business, and of course, where appropriate, civil society, then people will find the solutions. But if we have a dominance of, uh, of business and the quest for profit that is working against people and planet, then you won't have shared prosperity and we won't see a, uh, you know, a, a trust in the future. And I go back to the very risk of continuing to see our democracies break down. We have to fix the, the breakdown in the social model. We have to fix in that context for us, a broken labor market, and we have to fix the, uh, the climate crisis. Otherwise, we can't build an inclusive future. It's that simple. So people at the table designing the solutions, fundamental.